Ladies and gentlemen, we're starting on time. Happy International Women's Day, everyone. My name is, thank you. My name is Dan Sutherland. I'm the programming chair for the Saskatoon branch of Canadian International Council. I would like to thank all of you for taking time to be part of this this evening here in Treaty 6 territory, the traditional homeland of the Métis. Thank you for fulfilling the Canadian International Council, also called CIC's, mission on bringing people together, bringing together thoughtful thinkers and generating discussion. As many of you know, as many of you are part, we're having a big day tomorrow on immigration and refugee policy, and we are very blessed with the speaker that we're having here tonight. We have a lot of people to thank, and a lot will have some thanks taking place throughout this session, but I would like to pass the microphone on to our chair and moderator for the evening. You, you know him very well. Um, he had a very successful tour of duty as Saskatchewan's immigration minister. He's back here at the U of S as senior strategist for partnerships. Ladies and gentlemen, Rob Norris. Dan, thanks very much, and for, uh, for all of your work. Uh, Dan really was one of the visionaries, uh, Seat Sarkar, uh, Alan Anderson, among many others. And so uh, we're absolutely delighted to be here this evening. I'm going to introduce the minister in a minute. But we tried to take a very, very interesting approach, new approach, novel approach, and that is we wanted to engage communities for tonight and over the course of the conference. And one of the individuals that I approached on very short notice for sponsorship and support is Chris Garrett. She's the CEO of the Saskatoon and Region Home Builders. And I said, Chris, is there any chance that you might be able to help sponsor and support this initiative? And she wasn't alone, and we'll highlight some of the other, other sponsors. She said, Rob, this is exactly what we want to be doing more of. I'd be delighted. Now, Chris has literally run off one stage. She's here right now, and she's got to run back to another stage. And so, although a little bit unconventional, Chris, if I could, I'd like to welcome you to say a few remarks uh, before, uh, before I introduce the minister. Uh, Chris is, is a remarkable business person, a leadership um, really mentor for so many within our city and our province. Uh, and she is this very, very unique bridge. She embodies a bridge between New Brunswick and Saskatchewan. Uh, in her own way, she was a newcomer here and uh, decided to call Saskatchewan and Saskatoon home. Chris, come on up. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. You know, I, uh, I always try to foster collaboration uh, in the work that we do. For those who are not familiar with uh, the Saskatoon Region Home Builders Association, we re represent the residential construction industry, which is not a very obvious for some, and not a very obvious uh, relationship. But we very much um, need to foster that relationship of growth, welcoming newcomers, uh, having that investment into our city. Um, and you know, uh, we build homes, right, for newcomers. Uh, but not only that, but we're expected to have, you know, a big uh, shortage of labor in the next 10 years in our city. And so we're always looking for ways to uh, bring new people to Saskatoon and to our area. Um, our industry is responsible for $1.5 billion in investments um, just from everyday homeowners in our city alone. Uh, if we stretch that to our province, I think, I think it's over $6 billion. Um, and so when we look at opportunities like this, and, and I want to thank Rob for the opportunity, um, it's about uh, welcoming uh, new people to Saskatoon. Um, it's about investment in our communities, in, in these families, um, creating jobs, and, and you know, having an 
an economy that is continually growing. And so growth is always a concern to us uh, when we're talking about our city. And it's not a dialogue that is uncommon. Just this week we had some great dialogues with our city in terms of planning growth and how to get growth right. Uh, we need a solid plan for that. And we need to be able to have the right tools and, and the right long-term planning to make sure that we can uh, you know, not only plan our roads and our infrastructure, but really, uh, you know, welcome newcomers uh, to Saskatoon um, properly. And so I want to thank you, Rob, for this opportunity. And um, thank you again. I wish you a very uh, wonderful uh, conference in the next few days. And thank you so much. I appreciate the time to come visit Saskatoon Minister and the opportunity to meet you. And uh, thank you very much, Rob. Thanks, Chris. Well, now it is my um, distinct pleasure to, to represent uh, on behalf of, of our, uh, our committee, but most especially uh, everyone here in the room and well beyond, um, I hope a warm welcome uh, to a very, very distinguished member of parliament and a very distinguished minister, and that would probably be enough. You know, that we could probably get started. Uh, but in my old business, I would never leave an open mic. Not for very long, anyway. You know, uh, McLean's ran a story in early 2017 entitled, Calm in the Storm, the Rise and Rise of Ahmed Hussein. It was a remarkable story about a brand new minister. And one of the phrases that caught my attention in, in that story, as I read it at the time and as I've reread it since, was a notion that, quote, we've got someone in the control room who really understood what it was like to be on the shop floor. We can think about that when we think about a young teenager, I think a teenager of 16 years old, 1993, arriving in, in Canada. I think you had a couple brothers here, but without your parents. We can think about an undergrad degree at, at York and a law degree at the University of Ottawa. But if you scratch the surface, and we think about some of the other activities. What does that look like? You led the Regent Park Community Council. Some might say that would be interesting work, important work. If you know a little bit about Regent Park, that would be very demanding work. It is a hub of multiculturalism in Toronto. But if I said, actually, you led a successful endeavor to get half a billion dollars in a revitalization project for Regent Park, it gives you a sense of accomplishment, led to the Queen's gold medal for this person, who then became the president of the Canadian Somali Congress. And the Toronto Star identified him as one of the top 10 community contributors in the greater Toronto area. Someone who supported the Global Enrichment Foundation, supporting access and opportunities in advanced education for women in Eastern Africa. And then turned his attention and said, we also need to support journalists for human rights and press freedom. Then we'd have a sense of why in the election in 2015, the people of York Southwestern opted for this gentleman. But I'll tell you a very personal story. I had a, an opportunity to sit down with the minister on his last visit. And Grant Cook and I had a chance. We met briefly, spoke about a couple of issues. It was cordial. The minister was engaged, and then we went our separate ways. I was on a plane flying to Ottawa months later. 
And the minister was the one that said, hi. And the minister asked what I was doing. We just met with the finance committee. They had been in Saskatoon, their first stop. And I was going to see Minister Duncan. And he took time as we landed from Toronto into Ottawa. He took time, and this impressed me greatly because he had to get to question period. And he introduced me to one of his colleagues, Kamal Kira, who was a member of the Finance Committee but couldn't come to Saskatoon because she was with the minister for an announcement in Toronto. He took the time. He was able to reach out, reconnect, asked what I was doing, took the time to introduce me to one of his colleagues, parliamentary colleagues, before they went back to work. I'll be honest with you. I don't know if I would have done that as a minister. I'm going to be late for question period. My boss is not going to be happy. The speaker is going to be looking for me. And he took the time. And that speaks volumes about this individual who has so ably come into and been a remarkable calm in the storm when we think about so many of the issues affecting Canada and our global presence. He has quite literally helped set a great example and continues to for ministers of the Crown. Minister, uh, the reason I'm holding the mic is that way we don't have to readjust this when I'm done and you start. We're delighted to have you here in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan, Canada, here for the CIC Conference on Immigration. So um, my first visit to Saskatchewan was last year in the summer. Yeah, I'll just use this. It's much easier trying to adjust. Um, and, uh, you know, I thought, wow, you know, friendly people, great, great province, and I'll, I'll, I'll surely come back. So I came back yesterday. Uh, we landed in the morning um, of, uh, of yesterday in, in Regina. And uh, winter is over in Ontario. So, <laughs> And I've been in Canada for... Uh, 25 years now, and I've, I've never had, I've never been stuck in a snowbank. But I had to come to Saskatchewan to, to discover that. But what I uh, was amazed about that experience was, I was trying to get the car out of the parking lot and it got stuck in the snow. Um, you know, a woman saw me and, and from the other side of the fence and she said, here's a snow shovel, why don't you get yourself out? And I, I thought, that's really kind of her. I said, you know, give me some time and I'll do it. And, I, and as I'm doing it, she then came around to help and then an older gentleman came out of nowhere and suddenly there was a team of people and the third person showed up and people were pushing the car and saying, you know, do this to the wheel. Somehow I got out. I thought, what a, what a great province, you know? What a great, what a great number of people uh, who didn't know who I was, didn't care and, and just saw someone who needed help, who needed to be helped. I want to begin by uh, of course, recognizing that we are on uh, the traditional territory of the Cree and the, and the Métis Nation, and uh, that uh, we are on Treaty 6 territory. And to recognize that although we are celebrating Canada's 150th anniversary of Confederation, that the real history of Canada is much older than that. And I'm reminded of this everywhere that I go in this great land of ours including recently when I was in Halifax and my colleague, Member of Parliament, uh, Andy Fillmore, told me that uh, some of his constituents told him that uh, for them it's year 13,000, not 150. Uh, so it's very humbling to, to see that. Um, I wanted to start off by talking about uh, immigration, but starting off with what I thought and what I think a lot of Canadians still think of our immigration policy. That we welcome newcomers uh, because we're good people and it's, it's, you know, it's the right thing to do, but it's the kind thing to do and so on. And there's, there's no doubt that that's still true. I mean, we couldn't do half of the things we're doing in immigration, uh, welcoming newcomers. Uh, we, we couldn't do half of that if it weren't for the generosity and the welcoming nature of Canadians. But make no mistake about it, we need immigration. 
And again, a lot of Canadians know generally, broadly, that immigrants make a positive contribution to our country. But until I actually saw some of the figures myself, I didn't realize the extent to which we rely on immigration for some of our most important uh, policy priorities. Economic growth, job creation, job filling labor market gaps, filling skill shortages, and yes, demographics. So, I'll throw some statistics at you. 1972, we had 6.6 .6 working Canadians supporting each retiree. By 2012, that number had become four to one. So four working Canadians to each retiree by 2012. By 2036, if we don't do anything, if we don't become even more ambitious in immigration, 2036 is only 18 years away. It's not that long to go. We will have two working Canadians supporting each retiree. Now let me ask you this. How will we be able to maintain our much cherished social programs, our health care, our infrastructure, our pension plans, with a ratio of two working adults to one retiree? Let alone being ambitious and introducing new programs to address some of the pressing needs that our population has. For example, pharmacare. How, how do we even conceive of that? And if you want to uh, get a peek of what we would look like in 2036 if we don't take that action. You just have to go to, you don't have to wait till 2036, just go to Newfoundland and Labrador or other parts of Atlantic Canada and you'll see what I'm talking about. So in Newfoundland and Labrador, for every 100 adults who join the workforce, 125 retire. So there's already a gap of 25 people. How are we going to address that gap? Newfoundland and Labrador today, just to maintain its tax base and the status quo, let alone grow, needs 4,000 immigrants a year. They don't get 4,000 immigrants. They get much less than that. So the issue of being ambitious and more welcoming and aggressive in terms of going out into the world and recruiting the best and the brightest and reuniting families and welcoming people is no longer just the nice thing to do. It is the nice thing to do, make no mistake about it. I'm not denying that. I'm saying it is now even more than ever tied to our own prosperity, our own economic growth, our own demographic growth. We are a nation that has a very low birth rate and a very high um, aging population. So in order to uh, maintain our tax base, to pay for infrastructure, to pay for the, th the kinds of things that we cherish about our great country, um, we need immigration. It's not the only tool, because you also need a higher birth rate at home, but immigration does certainly help. Now, in addition to that, you also need immigration in an increasingly competitive global marketplace because immigrants allow countries like Canada to develop stronger people-to-people -people ties. And people-to-people -people ties are much, much more effective, sometimes way more effective than diplomatic relationships. Because when you have people-to-people -people connections, things start to happen. Markets start to open up, exchanges happen, relationships develop, and those are the people that, you know, uh, contribute to the prosperity of our, of our countries. So what are we doing as a government, now that we know what I just said, what are we doing to make sure that immigration really continues to serve our interests? Well, one of the first things we have to do is making sure that immigration uh, should focus on, on, on the client, should make sure that processing times reflect our ambitions and we don't frustrate people in terms of waiting for a long time for their applications. So I'm very proud of the fact that for the first time in Canadian immigration history, we actually have a unit in Immigration Canada called Client Service. And prior to us, I'll be very honest with you, the client was outside over there. We did all the work and the client was treated as a nuisance. You, st you stay there, we'll tell you 
when you should come and sign some papers. We never included the client in our decision-making process. We never put the client at the heart of everything that we do. And I, and I can tell you that now that we've started to do that, it has not only be led to much faster processing times, but much less frustration and more satisfaction with, with our clients, both Canadian and, and, inter and foreign clients. And that's because we've asked them what works. We've said, you know, does it help if you do things this way or that way? And they've given us the feedback. And that has resulted in, quite frankly, much better systems. And the results are out there to see. It used to take, to sponsor a spouse and, and accompany children, it used to take three years or more before we got into office. We said we will dramatically reduce that, and we have. We now have a system where if you want to sponsor a spouse, it takes 12 months or less. We inherited a 75,000 people backlog in the spousal program. We've reduced it by 60,000. So 60,000 spouses and family members are now reunited because of our efforts. So these things have an impact. Citizenship used to take 24 months. It now takes 12 months. Uh, we have reduced the living caregiver program backlog from 65,000 to 21,000. I've made a public promise, which now I have to live up to, that we will eliminate the remaining cases uh, by the end of this year, and we've reduced the processing time from five years to 12 months. Um, something as simple as replacing permanent resident cards that people use to travel used to take 10 to 18 months. It now takes 52 days. And I'm not satisfied. I want to bring that down to 14 days. Uh, so, so client services is a big part. The other part is making sure that we listen to Canadians, that we formulate new programs or we, we tweak existing ones so that we can address their needs. Because the whole point of the immigration system is to facilitate trade, to facilitate tourism, to facilitate uh, international students to come, and to facilitate family reunification. So instead of looking at applications and finding reasons to say no, we should look at an application and find a reason to say yes. Because that's what builds our country. And so we've, you know, the Global Skills Strategy, for example, is a program that came directly from businesses. They told us, you're taking too long to allow us to get talent to Canada. We want you know, temporary talent to come and turn around our companies and create jobs for Canadians. It was taking seven months. We now have a program called the Global Skills Strategy that processes the applications in 10 days or less. And I've been around the country and I've, I've been asking, is it really 10 days? And the employers are saying, yes, it is. Uh, express entry, we've tweaked it to make sure that international students are more represented there. Francophone immigration is another piece uh, in there. The provincial nominee program is working well, but we're testing the Atlantic immigration program because Atlantic Canada has particular challenges retaining immigrants. They can attract them, but it, it's hard to keep them there. So the Atlantic immigration program is the first employer-driven immigration program in Canadian history, where the employers go out and get the talent but also bring the family and put together a settlement plan. Now, why would an employer bother to do that? Because we give them a break on the labor market impact assessment and we give these people permanent residency in six months or less. So it's a trade-off and it's already beginning to have an impact and we hope through that program to give more applicants, more immigrants to Atlantic Canada and help with the retention. And we're testing it out because uh, government shouldn't be afraid to test out new ideas, and sometimes that leads to failure. But so far, it's working well, and the lessons we'll learn from that will certainly look to apply to the rest of the country. And I, I was having an informal chat with your Premier last night uh, about the possibility of expanding those kinds of out-of-the-box thinking uh, to, Atlantic Canada, uh, to, to the rest of Canada from Atlantic Canada. International students is another big piece. We are the first government and I believe I'm the first immigration minister who actually goes abroad, looks at prospective international students in the eye and says to them, not only do we want you to come and study in Canada, we want you to stay. Never happened before. We used to say to people, come and study. If you want to stay or go, we don't really care. Well, we do care. These are young people. They're keen. They're hardworking. They already speak one or both of our official languages. They went to school here, to our great institutions. Why would we not want to hang on to them? You know, especially in today's global race for talent, they can go anywhere. They don't have to choose Canada. 
but we have to work hard to keep them here. The startup visa program is another one that enables promising companies to come to Canada and grow and create jobs for all of us. That was a temporary program. We've made it permanent and expanded it. And finally, we have to make sure that as we do all these uh, economic programs that really help businesses uh, address labor market challenges and skill shortages, but also grow, that we should always have space in our immigration system to reunite families, uh, build those relationships, but also have uh, generous space in our immigration system to make sure that we have uh, room for our humanitarian program. Making room and welcoming refugees is part of Canada's humanitarian tradition, and we would lose a bit of ourselves if we got rid of that. So we have to, main we have to make sure that as we use immigration for our economic prosperity, we must ensure that a percentage of our economic, uh, uh, sorry, a percentage of our immigration system is geared towards refugees and other protected persons. And we are being ambitious. So in November, I presented the first multi-year immigration plan for tw in 20 years. In the past, we had one-year plans. Provinces and cities and settlement agencies were coming to us and saying, immigration is too important to have one-year plans where you know what's coming this year, but you don't know what's going to happen next year and you can't plan ahead. So now we have a three-year plan. And in that three-year plan, you see increases in permanent immigration every single year. 310,000 this year, 330 next year, 340,000 the year after that. These, these are permanent residents who are coming to Canada. 60% of them are economic, 20% family class, spouses and parents and then the remainder refugees and protected persons. So that's almost a million people over three years. And that is because employers need these people to fill these jobs. Make sure that we continue to serve the provincial nominee program that has spread the benefits of immigration across the country, not just in big cities. So that has to continue because part of being uh, a developed country and a progressive country is to make sure that we meet our international obligations and we we help as many as we can some of the refugees and other protected persons who are looking for sanctuary and i can tell you you know i was having this debate with uh, one of the one uh, um, a, a european minister for immigration at the united nations and he was saying you know ref we can't take refugees they don't bring any skills they're they're just a burden and they don't really add anything to anyone and i, I was so proud at that moment because a, a senior un official said excuse me i have to interrupt but the Canadian minister was a refugee, and I, nobody can argue that uh, he didn't make a contribution. You know? so, so on that note, I, I think we have a lot to be proud of. We are actually exporting our privately sponsored refugee model to other parts of the world, including the UK and Germany that now have the Canadian model. So we're exporting a lot of model, uh, th that model to the world. And that will enable more and more settlement, refugee settlement spaces to be created because we can't take everyone. But if we encourage others to, develop, to follow our generosity, then you know, more, more people will be accommodated. In addition to that, Budget 2018 had an additional 1,000 spaces for vulnerable women uh, to funding for vulnerable women, refugees, or uh, protected persons who are in vulnerable situations so that we can respond much quickly and we have the money to do that. And that follows the ad hoc program in which we've been quietly settling 1,200 uh, young women and girls who have escaped ISIS uh, atrocities. And they're, settled, they're being settled quietly all across the country with the supports that they need to overcome the trauma that they've experienced. So that is an example of the Canadian humanitarian tradition that's continuing after the Syrian refugee initiative. So I want to end it there, but I want you to know that you know, the five million Canadians who will be retiring soon will need uh, the labor force and the, demo the, the demographic uh, ability to, for us as a, as a society to support them, but also to pay for the, for the services that we expect from living in Canada. But more importantly, immigrants bring a different perspective. They bring innovation. They start businesses. They create jobs for all of us. And, and, and they create prosperity for all of us. And I think that, you know, when I go across the country, I see in the determination, in the eyes of newcomers that I had when I first came to Canada. So, you know, although I relied on the generosity of Canadians in that really difficult journey of settlement and integration, 
from the first moment that I was able to give back, I did. And I continue to do that because I feel that, you know, unlike Canadians who are born here, uh, m the newcomers who come and I, you know, I just had a citizenship ceremony this morning, they've chosen to, ch to join our Canadian family. And the reason for that is they see in this country a willingness to welcome uh, newcomers, to accept diversity, to embrace it as a source of strength. And I can tell you in the world today of turmoil and division based on identity and religion, that is a huge advantage that we have that we should cherish and we should invest more in and that we should continue to be ambitious. And so the fact that Saskatchewan only retains less than 10% of its international students to me tells me that we can do more uh, to, grow, to grow the Saskatchewan economy by, by retaining more international students and whatever we can do to help you, uh, I'm, I'm happy to. So on that note, I want to end it. Merci beaucoup, thank you very much and I'm happy to take your questions. Thank you, Rob. Minister, thank you. This is uh, this is one of those rare rare moments. We're we're, uh, we're going to offer a chance for for people to to raise questions. I think uh, what we're going to see is is probably a process. We're going to ask you to write down your questions, and that way, um, because there may be two or three issues that that come up, and we'll have, just have a bit of a running dialogue, sure. Minister, and, and work through it. I thought as that process just begins and you've touched on it, I thought I'd just maybe ask about, about provincial nominee programs. Sure. You know, when we, uh, when I had the opportunity in honor of, of being sworn in, um, we had a very modest provincial nominee program. So modest, no one needed to put a cap on it in Ottawa, because they didn't really notice us. But we got down to work, and I said, I want the best provincial nominee program in the country. Dr. Asit Sarkar became my special advisor. Not the biggest, but the best. When we think about Saskatchewan's population that's grown in the course of the last decade by 160,000 people. A decade ago, Minister, the expression was the last one out, turn out the lights. And now we're among the fastest growing. When we think about 160,000 population growth, half of those are newcomers. And the significance of Chris being here, we have, we have one of the quickest rates of home purchases for, for newcomers. I'm just wondering from your perspective, what do you see for the future of provincial nominee programs? How can we get better? How can we learn lessons from one another? And how can we work more collaboratively uh, with your department and the federal government? So I think the provincial nominee program has been really great uh, at spreading the benefits, the real benefits of immigration across the country, as opposed to just uh, being felt in the big cities. So it's a great program. I, I, I can't say good things enough about it. Uh, and it's reflected in our three-year plan. If you look at the three-year plan, the increases, th th we have uh, enabled the provincial nominee program to grow we will enable it to grow by 33%, because that's how much we believe in it. Uh, so that's number one. Number two, I think we're learning very much for, from the Atlantic program, which is on top of the provincial nominee program there. The lessons we will learn from uh, using immigration as a catalyst to, for economic growth in, uh, in areas with lower populations and retention problems, I think those lessons can easily be uh, transferred to provinces like Saskatchewan and uh, Manitoba and others, and even parts of provinces like Ontario. Northern Ontario is very different from Southern Ontario. So I think w those lessons, I am keen to fight the battle to make sure that we, we, we test out those pilots. Because the Atlantic program is still a pilot, but from the way it's going, I'll do whatever I can to make sure that it becomes permanent because it's, it's doing so well. So um, I think it's, it's the provincial nominee program, but there's more than that because the, the nominee program is always about caps and we don't have enough. 
but there is streams within the economy in Saskatchewan and other provinces that I, I feel are being left behind by the PMP. So you almost need another stream to address them or either make a deal with the provinces and say, look, we'll give you more, but you have to dedicate this many to this particular need. For example, Francophone immigration is, a, is an example of what I'm talking about. Yeah. You need to attract Francophone immigration in order to make sure that the Francophone community in, in Saskatchewan is viable. Yeah. Uh, so how do you do that through the PMP unless you, you get disciplined about it, right? Well, we... we um really appreciated that francophone stream and, and continue to because for us uh, it was a terrific source of of additional kind of federal room national yes, room yes. and uh, so I'm very very encouraged by that now I see that that we've probably got some questions Dan that you've there we are that we've got written down all right We've got, we've got one that offers this minister, and I'll, I'll summarize a little bit. The immigration system favors countries with better education and education and, and, and skills development become increasingly important in Canada, that notion of enlightened self-interest that you were speaking of. Mm -hmm. However, some countries uh, in Africa uh, have issues regarding literacy rates, among other, among other challenges. Is there any plan to have some additional consideration for people uh, that uh, may lack some of these educational and skills development initiatives or criteria or, or uh, qualifications? Um, we're just wondering about greater diversity. Sure, uh, so that's a really good question. I think it's being addressed at the moment through a number of things. So one, it's being addressed through something that's already happening. The other one is something that we have to do. Uh, one of the ways it's being uh, addressed is through our refugee intake. And even though I emphasized economic immigration in my speech, refugees make an equally important contribution. It may take a little bit longer than the skilled immigrant who's coming through Express Entry who has a job faster than even the Canadian average. But refugees eventually, with the right supports, they get there and they contribute just as well as everyone else. But it's also going to happen through the temporary foreign worker stream, which I have uh, an obligation through my mandate letter from the Prime Minister and uh, also the, the, our Minister for Workforce Development and Labor to find pathways for a few thousand temporary foreign workers uh, to become permanent residents. So that's one way we're doing that. We haven't done that yet, but we are working on that. Once that happens, we'll know in that universe how many of them want pathways, and, and we have to then um, incorporate that stream in the next cycle. One of the advantages of having a three-year immigration program is you can now adjust between years. So if in one year you don't land enough people, you can use that space for the next year. You couldn't do that before. It's, it's a... Uh profound, important, and I think enlightened paradigm shift. We've got a question here. Um, it's easy to talk about the state and, and instruments, categories, but this question is, um, as other countries are looking at our system, mm -hmm. that is the state <coughs> instruments, what's maybe some of those lessons learned that we might be able to offer other societies, maybe some societies that we see n on nightly news that may be struggling uh, in terms of dealing with newcomers? What are, what are some of the Canadian lessons regarding society? I think th that's a good question. I don't know if this mic is working. We can just, we can just share that. I, I, I think that's a really good question, and, and I, I spoke about exporting our privately sponsored refugee model. The reason a lot of countries are coming to us is they're saying, you know, our population doesn't like refugees because they haven't really met them or seen them. Uh, they won't support government sponsoring refugees, but we like this private model that you have. Maybe we can test it out. And then when they test it out, they find that people support it. And that's what happened in England. When, I, when, when we went there, we trained their officials, and then I was there to launch the program. They actually now have a UK uh, community sponsorship of refugees based on the Canadian model. They call it the UK community 
uh, refugee sponsorship scheme. I thought, mm, scheme sounds a little shady. Why don't you change that? They said, no, that's British English. You Canadians don't understand. I said, fine, it's okay. So apart from that word, we had everything else we agreed on. Germany just announced three weeks ago that they also adopted the Canadian model. Um, the second way we're influencing other countries is through our settlement and integration programs. They don't have them. And then they, a lot of these countries have issues with integration. They say these newcomers don't want to integrate, they don't want to learn the language, they don't want to learn. But then they don't, give them, they don't give them the supports to do that. So we don't go to them and say, you have to do this because Canadians are better. We don't do that. We just share with them the successes. So we share with them, I tell them, you know, hey, did you know that 93% of our newcomers speak either English or French? They're able to get that, they acquire English or French because of our training. Oh, we did, I didn't know that, that's, that's really, 93%, that's amazing. And then we say, you know, 85% of our newcomers eventually become Canadian citizens. Oh, that's amazing, they choose Canada, really. So that's how we kind of give it to them. We don't come at them with a superior attitude. But it's also a philosophical obstacle because I was being interviewed by German television and, the, and she said, you know, when you go and select refugees, you only pick the ones who are educated and everything. I said, no, they're refugees. We just, we have one criteria, which is vulnerability. She goes, yes, but if refugees come and they're wounded or they're old and they can't work, do you deport them? I said, no, we don't do that, they're refugees. So it's like I had to kind of go back to the basic principles of vulnerability. With, with, with someone from a society that's democratic, that uh, you know, but they, they, their concept is really different. But they're really interested in our integration model. You know why? Because the number one issue in every election in Europe, including the one that just ended in Italy, is immigration. Oh, how do we prevent people from coming in? Oh, and how do we integrate those who are here? That's the number one. And which is the country that can help them answer that? The only country in the world is Canada. So they're increasingly looking to us. We're engaged in immigration diplomacy. They come here. We quietly talk to them about it. They go back. They test new things. And I think, you know, that's something that I think if more Canadians knew, they would be really proud of that. Minister, I'm reminded of a, a phrase from Tony Blair, who, uh, who offered a very, very uh, quick and catchy summary of the significance of the issue. And that is, uh, he said, uh, are people moving in or are people moving out? And uh, the clear message from Canada uh, with a new phrase for me that you've just offered is the notion of immigration diplomacy, that we're, we're, we are quietly and competently <laughs> helping others while we also refine our initiatives. This question here actually goes back to, uh, uh, to, the, to the refugee question, and it's about uh, refugees and jobs. Yep. And, and a big part of successful settlement uh, is about people going to work, yes. and and is there more? Is there more that can be done? Maybe by the federal government, maybe on a federal provincial uh, basis, or involving new partners, thinking outside the box, so that we can get more people moving uh, to employment opportunities and jobs a little sooner. Absolutely, and we have. I mean, we have made those investments. If you look at uh, the increases we've we've made in immigration. We, we haven't increased one extra newcomer without making sure that we have the money to provide settlement and integration services for them. Job supports, language training, orientation, mental health supports, uh, you know, youth, refugee youth in school, for example, helping them adjust making that transition. We have, and we're spending record amounts of money. Every single year, our settlement budget goes up. Uh, and, and it's a lot of money. It's the biggest expense in the overall immigration ministry. But I can tell you, if you look at the data, and we collect a lot of data, you see the, how those investments pay off so quickly in terms of enabling these people to be successful, but also enabling those people, those newcomers, to quickly make really substantial contributions to Canada. One thing I want to talk about is something that, that isn't talked about enough. Uh, in the last budget, we had $27.5 million targeted towards newcomers who had professional uh, backgrounds. So electricians, nurses, teachers, engineers, doctors, lawyers, dentists. 
And, you know, of course, the, the professional bodies that run these people come under the provinces. But there's a lot of other softer barriers that even when a pharmacist is, is in many provinces now has a clear path to get license, there's other barriers like income support. They don't have the money to pay for the exams and the fees and they have to quit work to study for the, I mean, it's, it becomes hard. So that strategy now gives them loans in order to study for those exams. For the, for the newcomers who have been selected to come to Canada and they have a professional background, we actually provide pre-arrival services so that they can start, you know, that engineer from Ecuador who we know is coming to Saskatoon, we'll connect them with the Saskatchewan body that is responsible for engineers so that they can start the licensing process in Ecuador so that they hit the ground running when they come to Canada. Because I can tell you a lot of immigrants, will, newcomers will say, you know, um, I have all these things in Canada now, but the one thing I don't have, which I had a lot of back home, is time. So since they have a lot of time there, why not give them the tools to start the licensing process so that they can come here, practice in their own field, and then we benefit from their services. That is a, uh, it's a recurring theme. I can remember uh, as I was approached by one organization about how to overcome, especially the tests and, and qualifications. Uh, some of them can cost thousands and thousands of dollars. And Dr. Sarkar and others did some, some research. We have actually set up a, a microfinance facility oh, wow. to help overcome some of those initiatives so that uh, for relatively small amounts of money, um, people could actually begin to move forward and repay those very, very quickly. We've got a question here about international students. Those studying, then you've made reference to it. We, we continue to struggle in Saskatchewan, but we're not alone. Um, they want to have permanent residency. Mm -hmm. um, there are some challenges that come up and some frustrations. For one example, students whose first language is English currently have to complete testing for the same. Um, we're just wondering, are there further modifications within the system that can make it a little easier or send what I would say a clearer message about Canada's desire to not simply have them study, but have stay. people stay? That's a fair point. I just met a group of international students before I came to this event, and that issue came up, the issue of language. And I told them, you know, surprise, surprise, I'm not just here to answer questions, I'm actually here to listen to you and, and, and get some of the pressure points that, that I may not have an answer for. So that was one where I told them, look, I don't have an answer, I'm sorry, but I'll look into it and get back to you. Having said that, we are... I believe the most generous country when it comes to international students. We, work, we allow international students to work for up to 20 hours a week during the school year. When schools closed in the winter uh, holidays and the summer holidays, we allow international students to work for full time. After graduation, we allow them to work for, get a work permit for up to three years, which incidentally allows them to get PR status. Under the express entry system, we've made some changes to, to give an additional 30 points for international students. Actually, they get double of the points. So they get points for studying in Canada, and then they get points for being an international student. So they, they're getting double the points. And we're giving more points to international students who, or other applicants in the, uh, the uh, express entry system who have siblings in Canada. We're giving more points to francophone applicants. What that has done is we've seen an immediate change. So international students used to be about a third of the successful applicants under Express Entry. Now they're almost a half. Uh, the changes we made for francophone applicants have doubled their number. Used 2% of the successful applicants were fra francophone. Now it's 4%, and it's growing. So, so, so that's what we've done so far. I would also encourage international students to, uh, to look at our Atlantic immigration program if, there's, if they have no other way of staying in Canada. Because under the Atlantic program, an international student doesn't actually need work experience. They just need a job offer. If they have a job offer from a designated employer in Atlantic Canada, we will give them PR in six months or less. That's an amazing stream. And it's one of the streams within the Atlantic immigration program. Mobilité Francophone is another program where if you're, fr if, you know, if you're Francophone and you're hired by an employer, the employer gets a break on the labor market impact assessment. 
You know, so a lot of employers don't know these things. So we've mo made a lot of movements, and I was telling the students, please take advantage of these news streams, but a lot of them are not as known. I have to speak about some of these things 30 times before someone says, oh, I've heard of you speak about this. So it takes time to get going, but we've, we've made a lot of changes, and we, for the first time, have a, a strategy around saying, and I, I said in my speech, we clearly want more international students to stay and help provinces like Saskatchewan keep them here because they make great citizens and make an amazing contribution to your province. Well, I, I echo that. We've got a question about um, interim federal health programs. Uh, increasing coverage, uh, for example, dental treatment, um, and also overcoming some administrative barriers. And I'm just wondering, again, it, it extends out beyond your ministry a little bit into others and certainly in the, into the realm of, of the provinces as well. But is there any conversation about, uh, again, overcoming or, or uh, attempting to better understand what some barriers may be regarding health coverage? Yeah, so we're the, just so you know where we came from, uh, we inherited a situation where the previous government cut refugee health care to the most vulnerable people, pregnant women, victims of torture. And, you know, that case went all the way to the federal court. And the federal court, I believe the federal court or the federal court of appeal said that what the previous government did was cruel and unusual punishment for the most vulnerable people in this society. So I'm proud of the fact that we're the party that restored refugee health care. And I have used my discretion as minister to cover people who sometimes are not even uh, covered previously in special circumstances. So, for example, uh, the asylum seekers who uh, overwhelmed uh, the province of Quebec last year, uh, because of the nature of the numbers that came in, the system couldn't process them quickly enough. So through no fault of their own, they had to wait weeks or months for a hearing which meant that they didn't get coverage. So I made an exemption and I gave them coverage, which allowed them to also get a work permit. So we try as much as possible. Of course, there's always budgetary pressures, but if there's a way, I mean, we had a federal, provincial, territorial ministers of immigration meeting and ministers responsible for Francophone affairs uh, on Friday. Uh, I'm always open to, to, to doing what we can. And it's one of the programs that actually is demand-based. So. We don't look at the cost in terms of, if there's higher demand, we spend more money. If people need that service, we, we, we do it. In terms of dental, I'm not really sure if, you know, how we would be able to go about that. I think it's a conversation we need to also have with the provinces. But I'm proud of the fact that we restored that healthcare coverage for refugees. Minister, we've got another question about, about uh, refugees and um, the rebuilding or revitalization of the refugee settlement program. Your, your government came in, a very, very clear mandate, uh, very, very uh, determined effort, especially regarding Syria, but now we see it goes well beyond that. Um, what does it look like a year or two on as far as successful settlement, and are there some lessons learned already that perhaps relate to the federal government, but perhaps relate to all of us. Actually, or you know, we're we're talking about communities. We're talking about communities like Saskatoon and Regina and Prince Albert and and any number of communities across the the country. What is what does successful settlement look like? And it's not about passing the buck. It's about making sure we're all working maybe a, a little more closely together to ensure that uh, our new neighbors feel as comfortable and and uh, get settled as quickly as possible. That's a really great question. When we've looked at the Syrian, how the Syrian refugees are doing, they're on the same trajectory as previous uh, cohorts of refugees. So they're not doing worse or better than previous uh, folks. And it's the same trajectory. And, and we, you have to understand, refugee resettlement and integration is, is a long journey. It's not an immediate turnaround. It's much faster with the privately sponsored refugees because they tend to have more supports around them. But eventually, the two of them, the two streams kind of join, and uh, you can't tell the difference in terms of economic outcomes. We, I believe we are world leaders in terms of resettling and integrating all newcomers, including refugees. So as a country, I think we're a global leader. 
Having said that, it doesn't mean that we can't improve the system. So one of the things that uh, we learn from others who, who think we have it figured out, we still learn from them too. Uh, I went to Germany and I noticed that they were doing something amazing. So they took young refugees and integrated them to their really amazing apprenticeship programs and found a way to train them language training and apprenticeship together. We tend to do it sequentially. So that's an idea that I, I really liked and I brought it back to Canada and now we're testing it in Canada. The second one is having more of the private sector uh, find a way to assist in that integration process. There is a great thirst and hunger in the private sector to be involved in this process. They just don't have avenues to do so. So we have to find ways to, to work more with, with private sector. So I'm told I have one last question, unfortunately. And then, uh, That's uh, the nature of uh, the nature of evenings like this. Uh, there are more more questions and uh, more opportunities for dialogue. But what we've committed to is we're going to make sure we send the remainder of the questions with you, and that way uh, you'll at least have a, a sense of some of the questions. Maybe it's fitting to uh, to just build a little bit on this theme. Um, Certainly, uh, John Hopkins out of Regina uh, on his Chamber of Commerce was a, a lead advocate for, for in, engaging um, Syrian refugees through the private sector. And so right here in the province, we've, we've seen examples of that. One of the challenges, not simply for refugees, but across the, across the board, uh, credential and qualification recognition. Yeah. And um, is there more that, again, this isn't simply kind of uh, offering that the, the buck stops with you. It's, I hope, beginning a conversation. Is there even more that we can and should be doing about credential and, and uh, qualification recognition, including recognizing the value of experience uh, before coming to Canada? And uh, uh, I, think, I think that barrier has been a perennial yes. challenge within our Canadian uh, polity and within our communities and I'm, I'm just wondering where where your thoughts might be on that so so I I think it's fair to say that the the myth so sorry not the myth the story of the of the newcomer professional driving a cab is still true but it's not as true as it was many years ago what I mean by that is many many professional bodies have actually moved to be fair to the to the point uh, there have some who haven't moved much, like medicine. Medicine's still where it was many years ago, but many other professional bodies have really moved to, to deal with this issue. They've really addressed it. Engineers, uh, pharmacists, yeah. even lawyers. I mean, many, so many bodies have listened. So when, whenever I hear Canadians talk about credentials, I always say, it's still an issue, but could you please also recognize that there's been a lot of movement by, by, um, by the bodies, by the provinces, and by the federal government. I just spoke about the, the, the targeted employment strategy. It's not just about pre-arrival, but not just about loans. But after they get their licensing, the problem is, oh, well, then you don't have Canadian working experience. So we actually give them a paid internship. We pay for them to get Canadian work experience. We pay for them to get mentorship. We pay for them to get job matching. We also... Uh, help and we fund ways, strategies to have employers take a chance on those, on those newcomers and, and work with organizations that bridge that gap. So, so this, there's a lot that has been done. I don't think it's fast enough or ambitious enough for me or you or many Canadians, but I, I think it's also fair to say a lot has been done and I think more can be done. Um, I think now that the governments have moved and, and a lot of the professional bodies have moved, some pressure needs to be brought to the remaining professional bodies like, uh, like medicine and then also employers. I think a lot of employers simply don't take a chance on newcomers and I think they should because they'll be pleasantly surprised by the results. Minister, on, on that, uh, I just want to, uh, to offer this. Uh, very very brief thanks. We're gonna we're gonna turn the microphone over to Dr. Murray Fulton. We're we're sitting here in uh, the the Diefenbaker Canada Center, and it's home to the Johnson Shoyama uh, Graduate School of of Public Policy. 
and uh, named after two remarkable officials that served both Saskatchewan and then Canada very, very ably. And so, uh, Marie, if I could ask you to come up and, and uh, say a few words of thanks. We wouldn't be here uh, if it were not for the valuable contribution and significant investment of the Johnson Shoyama Center in this evening, but also in the conference. So, and so, uh, Marie, a special thanks to you and your colleagues. I, I, before I, you do that, I just wanted to uh, sincerely thank you for the very kind introduction and your friendship, and to thank all of you for uh, taking the time to come on a cold Saskatchewan uh, afternoon, <laughs> evening, and, and asking really, really very uh, uh, critical questions that touch at uh, some of the uh, pressure points, but also some of the good things that we're doing uh, in, this, in this field. And I hope to continue this conversation. There's an email that uh, we solicit advice on called consultations at cic.gc.ca, consultations at cic.gc.ca. We not only uh, take uh, questions, but also just advice on how we can do things better, because I, I, I can tell you a lot of good things that we're doing now came from, from Canadians and just listening to them. So thank you very much. Thank you to the International Center, and, and thank you all for welcoming me to Saskatoon. Appreciate it. Um, Rob, thank you, um, and um, Honourable Minister, thank you for um, your most illuminating remarks and really a stimulating discussion. I, I've just thoroughly enjoyed this tonight. Um, my name is Murray Fulton. Um, I am the director of the Johnson Shyama Graduate School of Public Policy, as Rob has um, just outlined. Um, the Johnson Shyama Graduate School of Public Policy, for those of you who don't know, is a place where people from various cultures, educational backgrounds, experiences, and ideologies come together to learn, conduct research, and engage with all sorts of groups, from government to indigenous organizations to the private sector um, and, the, and the much larger community um, to advance public value. And it, I, I want to just pick up on that public value um, aspect. Um, Canadian society today faces complex issues, as you all know, um, immigration, reconciliation, trade, um, you name it, um, many of which um, are actually things that, that you, will, um, that you um, hold um, dear to your heart. And it is imperative that we, as um, a public institution, be front and center in the discussions so that we can educate and prepare our students to become better citizens and public servants, both in Canada and abroad. Um, I want to thank the Canadian International Council and um, the Saskatoon branch for organizing tonight's events and tomorrow's sessions. Um, it's really been great working with Dan, with Rob, um, the, the rest of the group. Um, we are absolutely delighted um, to have the conference here and to have um, the minister here tonight. Um, also, thanks to all the sponsors, and we're going to hear about that in just a second. Um, we really believe uh, here at the um, Johnson Shyama School that is the kind of dialogue that's similar to the one we had tonight that is vital to addressing um, the challenges of today and the future. Um, I don't think we can get through the issues that we've got to get through without dialogue, um, and I'm really pleased to um, be part of this. Um, and finally, I would like to uh, present a small token of our appreciation to the minister. <laughs> You are very welcome. Um, I'm going to put these in okay. your trusting sure. uh, care. I will. And uh, we can't thank you enough for taking time. No uh, thank you. You're, uh, you've kept your word. You've returned to Saskatchewan. And there, but there is just one, one point. Yes. Uh, you mentioned that winter is over in Toronto. Uh, <laughs> it's over in Saskatoon, too. This is actually summer. <laughs> <laughs> Minister. Thank Thanks you very so much. much. Thank you. Okay. Great. Wonderful. Thanks, Minister. Thank you. Great. Well, I um, I'd like to to invite a uh, few people up to uh, to the front. If I could get it, Alan Anderson up and and a seat, and Dan, if you can come up. There have been there have been many that have helped. These three individuals invited me to a meeting that I thought was just a cup of coffee. A little more than that. And uh, they had a bold idea. 
when I first became minister, there was a, a federal report out. And the subtitle of that report was about settlement and immigration in Canada's hinterland. I was taken aback. Here I was thinking we were the center of the universe. It showed us that we had a lot of work to do. These three gentlemen reinforced that that work continues. And the only way that we can keep our global orientation, which maybe we've taken for granted, frankly, because we look around the world and those, those with orientations other than being globalists might have taken a few steps forward lately. But the only way we can remain and retain our momentum is actually having people at grassroots sitting down over cups of coffee saying, shouldn't we encourage a conversation? Who might come? And they asked that. And I said, well, maybe the federal minister would come. I think he's really interested about what's going on in Saskatchewan and Prince Edward Island, just as he was in Regent Park before he was elected. And he was good to his word that he wanted to come back to Saskatchewan. But when I sat down with his people, they said, this concept can be a foundation for his visit because of the work that you're willing to put in and the vision that you're willing to share. And so to the three of you, I want to offer my heartfelt thanks for the opportunity to be included in that. We did something else along the way. We said, let's see if we can broaden this out. And I've touched on this. So now, Deb, you're in the back. You're just sitting quiet. I said, you want to say a few words today, Deb? Stand up. Stand up. Yeah, yeah. You're going to hear from Deb tomorrow. He said, no, I don't want to say anything tonight, Rob. I'm saving it all for tomorrow. This gentleman arrived in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan, Canada with $20. And he was the first to step up and say, I'm going to help sponsor and support this conference. And so you'll see that we've offered the Royal LePage and Green Villas uh, logo right here. He was the first because he said, I want to show a contribution back. This isn't simply about benefiting from my presence here, but my contribution in modest ways back. And I think that really speaks volumes about Deb, but also about the value of this conversation and of immigration that we see. Westcap, we're going to hear uh, tomorrow from Grant Cook. He's going to join us tomorrow afternoon. Uh, for me, the notion that Grant Cook would join us really speaks volumes. Here's a man who is as globally connected as anyone I know. And he said, Rob, this is really, really important. And he grew up. He's not a first generation newcomer, but he grew up in Outlook, and he's got an interesting story, and we're going to tell a story about entrepreneurship, and he helped to give that some guidance. And you've heard from Chris, and again, the notion that the Saskatoon and Region Home Builders would step up to help support this. For me, what I wanted to show was, we're not alone in this room. This has an intellectual rigor to it, but it's got community engagement. It's also got corporate support. And that's a little bit new for all of us as we sit here. Because traditionally, we would have maybe said, is there a little bit of government money or maybe some other public money? And I wanted to demonstrate that there is that. But there is more than that. And the allies we have extend beyond sector, beyond notions that we might traditionally think. And so to our corporate sponsors, and to the Johnson Shoyama School, who has really stepped up, and to Dan, who has personally stepped up, because he said the recording of this is going to be so significant. To everyone that's helped ensure this could move forward, I want to offer a heartfelt thanks. It demonstrates the commitment, a deep commitment, that continues to define Saskatchewan and Saskatoon. Dan, I'm going to hand it back over to you to offer some concluding remarks. <clears throat> Thank you to everyone who has had an opportunity to speak this evening. Thank you for you 
for showing up. Um, three things that have come to mind for me over and over again as we plan this is words matter, talk matter, and people matter. I think all of you are a testament to that. And frankly, tomorrow, for those of you who are booked in for Friday, we've got our work cut out for us. But thank you for being on this ride. Let's continue talking. Let's keep sharing words. Keep meeting people. There's a reception going to take place right away. Um, everything opens up at 8 a.m. tomorrow. Opening, uh, the, the opening bell, the official start is 9 a.m. So for those of you who are going to be here uh, tomorrow morning, look forward to seeing you. And let's go eat. Thank you very much.